Hi, Miles here, and welcome to item number one of my Suspicious Consumer Electrical Devices uh, Teardown series that I'll be uploading over the next couple of months. If you missed my introduction video, basically, I've been picking up items like this over the last year, putting them all in a big bag in the corner, forgetting about them. Uh, but now what I'll be doing is taking items out one at a time, completely random, bring it over here, open the box on camera, dismantle the item, give it a bit of a tear down to establish what I think are its good points, its bad points, what I think is dangerous about the item, and uh, telling you guys what I think. So on with the video, item number one, selected completely at random. It's a box and it says on it, Magic Cube. I can just about remember what this is and where it came from. I saw it for sale on eBay actually, it was worryingly cheap. Uh, it's pedalled as a power extension lead, I'll, I'll open it in just a second so you can have a look. It was for sale here in the UK from a UK seller, someone had obviously imported it from, from overseas. Doesn't actually say on the box where it's come from. I'm going to hazard a guess China, maybe it'll say on the item itself. We'll have a look. Um, on the listing on eBay, it looked really quite um, disturbing in a number of ways, so I decided to buy it and uh, do a do a tear down of it. Quite a few items had already been sold. You know, on eBay, it tells you how many other how many other uh, items have been sold of this particular type, and it was something like 60. So there's quite a few of these already floating around the UK in use, presumably, um, unless they've all caught fire and burned the houses down. So let's have a look at the box. It says on it, Magic Cube, you can probably just about read that, yep. That's about all it says in terms of the product name. Magic Cube could mean anything really. There is a bit of a picture of what looks like a speed camera no manufacturer's name and that's always suspicious because they obviously don't want you to know who made it so it can't possibly be traced back to the, uh, the original factory no importer name no nothing you would never know where it came from unless it says on the item itself I want to have a look but certainly not in the box there's no no information on the manufacturer uh, it's all in English it's obviously intended for the uh, English speaking market Got some pictures of birds on. And these are presumably clouds, not quite sure what that means. But there we go. And if you can read that there, it says six major updates. Sounds interesting. USB interface. Okay, so it's got USB sockets on it. Compatible with a variety of smartphones, tablets, cameras, etc. Well, if it's USB, it should be compatible with with all of them if they've got USB charging. Smart matching, adapt to different power output currents according to different mobile phone. It's not very well written, but I think it means that it'll adjust the power depending on the device, but that's all built into the USB standard anyway, so that's kind of irrelevant. Three, housing material. The shell is made out of flame retardant alloy material. Four, colour shell, more colourful, more fashion. Well, okay. If you need your power extension, it needs to be fashionable, and that's up to you. Integrated copper core, right, sounds good. Strong electrical conduction, small calorific power, long service life, safety in use. Okay, that sounds very reassuring. Six, safety protection. An all-over inspection, more safety guarantee. It's got some product technical parameters. Rated current 10 amps. Okay. Rated voltage, 110 to 250 volts, which means it can be used more or less anywhere in the world. Rated power, 2,500 watts. Okay. USB output current, 2.1 amps. Wire material, copper. Well, that's a relief. Product size, six and a half by six and a half by six and a half centimeters. Pencil and cube says here, PC. PC engineering plastics. Shell with high flame retardant PC engineering plastics, which can effectively prevent the fire, the maximum degree of safety hazards. Well, that's pretty rubbish wording. Again, I guess it's designed to uh, 
reassure your niggling doubts that this thing is a safe thing to have in your house. It says here, CU High Elastic Phosphor Copper. High Elastic Phosphor Copper has excellent conductive property, elasticity and long service life. Again, it's kind of nonsense really, don't really know what it's trying to say. I think it's, again, just trying to be reassuring. It says here again, maximum power 2,500 watts, okay. Upgrade longer and thicker power line, good. Two meter line, longer and thicker. Longer and thicker than what? A previous version of this? Well, we'll have a look at the cable we take out of the box. A warning, another warning as well. Let's look at this one first. Before use, please check the function of the electrical appliances and the rate's current. Make sure the sum of the rated current is less than 2,500 watts. Okay. What does this say? Our products are divided into Magic Cube General Set, USB socket set and five side jack set. Detailed information is in accordance with the final product the general set only provides the jack exchanging form with high quality of exchanging interface. USB socket sets can be compatible with a vast majority universal serial bus charging equipment, which can conveniently charge mobile phone, MP3, MP4, tablet, computers, and digital cameras and other devices. It's appallingly written. Don't really know what the heck it's on about, but there we go. Special warning, please do not use in damp environment. Okay, I wouldn't. That's basically what it says on the box as far as I can see, no other wording. No. Okay, let's open the box and have a look. Okay, and there's the, uh, the device. Nothing else left, there. that's the empty box. Okay. Okay, I've got a number of problems with this already. A number of things actually not as bad as I thought. The, yeah, it's got one of these uh, sort of sandwich ties for the cable. Let's undo that so we look at the cable first of all. That's quite important. Two meters it says. Yeah, I can believe that probably is. They're about two meters. I'm going to start by talking about the plug. This is the plug it's come with. This is a very non-compliant plug. In fact, it's quite dangerous. There's a number of problems with it. The first problem that's quite obvious to me is there's absolutely no fuse in it. Let me show you a stereotypical British uh, plug. This is the standard here in the UK. These have fuses in, see how it's much bigger? You can see on the diagram there, it's supposed to have a fuse. Let me take it apart and show you what the fuse looks like, in case you've never seen one of these before. I'm just going to open this plug up. This is what a British standard plug looks like inside. You see how is this fuse here? This is rated at 13 amps, that's the maximum you're allowed in one of these plugs here in the UK. It's a 13 amp system. And that fuse sits between the line or the live uh, pin and the device, so that if the device establishes a fault and suddenly starts taking an awful lot of current, the fuse will blow and, and protect you and the device from a uh, major overload and consequential uh, fire. Now this plug doesn't have a fuse. There's clearly no way to put one in and the thing's far too small to have one. Now if you've visited or live in a country that's not the UK, let's say somewhere in mainland Europe or the United States for instance, you might notice that the plugs in these other places, uh, in fact most of the rest of the world, they don't have fuses in either. So you could almost be forgiven for thinking, well why did the British plugs even need fuses? Uh, other countries don't seem to mind not having fuses. Why do the British need one? Is it a little bit over the top in terms of electrical safety? Do you need it? Well, the answer is yes, you do need it uh, because our circuits are designed quite differently to those of overseas. 
You see, in a country like the United States, you have radial circuits. And what that means is the fuse that protects the appliance, be it a, a kettle or a toaster or a computer or whatever it is, the fuse that protects that device from overload is located in the fuse board, usually by the front door. There's a, a big uh, cabinet full of fuses and each fuse protects usually one, sometimes one or two sockets, um, protects the devices on that socket and that's where the fuse is located. So you do have a fuse, it's located on the fuse board. And here in the UK we have a different system, we have ring circuits. We still have a fuse board, we generally call them consumer units these days, and inside there is a very large fuse, much bigger than the ones you get in countries like the US, and that very large fuse protects a whole ring. And a ring basically consists of a big loop of sockets. There might be 10 sockets, there might be more sockets. You know, I've seen them up to 20 sockets on one ring. So it goes off to one, it loops them all together and comes back to the fuse board. So you do have that fuse, that protection, but it's very, very big. It's designed to protect the entire ring so that if somebody drills through the cable or it's crushed in a fall and there's a short in the ring circuit itself, that fuse will blow and protect the ring but that fuse provides very little protection to the devices themselves. So the way we get around that in the UK is we put a fuse in the device plug itself. So every device that plugs into the ring has its own little fuse. And actually it's a good system, it works well. It also means rather than having one set fuse size, you can actually change the fuse size depending on the device. So it's a, if it's a very low power device, like a, a table lamp, you could put a fuse in that's maybe one amp. If it's a bigger device, something like a toaster, maybe you'd want a 10 amp or the maximum mean point is 13 amp. So it's very important here in the UK that every device has its own fuse in the plug. So going back to this one, you can see there is no fuse in there, so you've got no protection. So if this device develops a fault like a short circuit or it's overloaded in some other way, you've got no protection. It'll just burst into flames, it'll melt um, and it's unlikely to trip the main building fuse for the ring. Your other problem with this plug is it's too small. These are pretty big, these British ones, but that's to make it hard for you to accidentally touch the contacts as you're inserting the plug or removing it. Um, see with a big plug like this, you can see with the protection plates there, it's quite difficult to get your fingers around it and touch them as it's going in and out of the, uh, the socket. That's deliberate. With this it's much smaller, it's much easier to be accidentally touching the contacts. There's another fairly major and obvious problem with this. The earth pin is shrouded and it should not be. If you look at a proper British plug, see how there's no shroud on it? And this earth pin is another safety feature that they all have and it's there to protect you in case the case of the device becomes live with an electrical fault within the device. Let's say in the case of a, a kettle, imagine a kettle with a, a metal body. If inside that kettle the wire becomes loose from repeated movement and the, the live wire coming into it just breaks away from its, um, its holder and that live wire then rests against the case of the kettle, that kettle body will become live. So as soon as you touch the kettle, uh, you're going to get a serious electric shock which could kill you. So the purpose of the earth pin, this connects via the wire to the body of the appliance so that the electricity is carried away safely via the earth connection rather than through you into the ground. So this dodgy uh, plug here, it does have an earth pin but you can see it's shrouded. And that means it's not going to work because you see with a UK socket, the earth receiver is near the top so if you can imagine when this goes into the socket there's some contacts and you want the earth to connect before the power carrying uh, contacts do that's why these are shrouded and this one isn't because the contacts within the socket that this bites into are very near the surface of the socket so it bites into it first and then as it slides in it's holding it near the end that's invariably how it is so this one will always make contact before these two. So you've defeated it by having a shroud because yeah, that will connect as it goes in, but then it will move past it. So by the time these two are connected, the earth is disconnected. So therefore you've lost that safety feature. 
if the case of the device that you're plugging into this becomes live, you're going to take a heck of a job because not even the fuse in this is going to blow because there isn't one and it's not going to flow to earth because it can't connect. This plug is dangerous, it's unsafe for a number of reasons, it's not legal in the UK. If you have one of these plugs, or any one of these plugs, I suggest you throw it away quickly. Let's move this to one side. Let's continue our investigation here. Let's have a look at the cable. Yeah, I'd say it's about two meters. I don't feel the need to measure it exactly. It feels very uh, flexible. Actually, feels quite nice. There's a little bit of space in there, which it shouldn't really feel. It should be all quite tight. It feels a little bit thinner than I would expect. Doesn't seem to be a lot of metal in there. I don't know, it feels mostly plastic, to be honest, which is not a good sign. Is they're reckoning you can power 2,500 watt devices on this. Uh, 10 amps, they reckon. Okay, let's have a look at the device itself. Well, it's a fairly attractive product. You know, can't knock that. It is a cube. And it's got four of these sort of um, what you see labelled as international sockets. They're a terrible invention. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's got four of them, so you can plug four uh, four mains devices into this. You've also got obviously two USB sockets. They look fairly sort of innocuous. There appears to be a power switch here too. It does, you'll never see on the camera, it does have a little power symbol on it. I guess that's what that does. It's made of clear plastic, so I'm presuming it lights up when it's plugged in. We'll find out in a minute. There is some text on it too. It says, um, it's got some Chinese writing, technical parameters, max 2,500 watts, max 10 amps, 250 volts. Okay. Feels solid enough, the plastic in it seems quite quite robust. Strangely the four sockets on it alternate with the direction of the, the direction of the plug like this one. The live neutral is this end. And on this one they're at the top end and then it rotates to the bottom again and it rotates to the top. Not really sure why it does that. Can't think of any massive safety reason why that would be a problem. It just seems a bit unusual. Now looking at these uh, these sockets here, these are what get called international sockets. There is no standard for these. It's basically a, a socket that you can shove more or less any plug from any country in. And it achieves this by just having big enough apertures and flexible enough springs that more or less anything will fit in. Uh, nothing fits in particularly well. Um, they're kind of a nice idea, but they don't really work very well. They're not, they're not a standard here in the UK. If you see one of these, they're not compliant. Uh, on this particular item, there's no shutters. You'll notice on a UK socket, it's quite a nice feature actually. Um, because the live and neutral pins are reasonably sized, compared to like a US one, for instance, where they're, they're quite small slots, to prevent little, uh, toddlers and so forth, sticking things like knitter needles and forks into the holes and fatally electrocuting themselves. Here in the UK, we have shutters over them. And if you have a closer look, you'll see, you can't see the contacts within. So if you were to put in a, a metal item, let's say this screwdriver, it won't go in because there's a shutter. And that shutter has to open before the plug can be inserted. And that works through a clever mechanism through the earth pin. So when the earth pin goes in, the shutter will open, and that's why the earth pin is longer. So as it goes in, it opens the shutter, and there you go, it'll go in. This particular set of sockets on here, there are no shutters whatsoever. And in fact, the apertures are really quite big. There's no way I could get my fingers in there. But I bet a very small child could put their fingers in there. So shutters are a good invention, and this doesn't have them. So on the basis of that, it's not legal here in the UK. Now another problem I've noticed with this, the contacts that grip the pins, the pins are the, the plug, 
contacts within the socket are actually very close to the surface. They can't be more than about five mil from the surface. So you really wouldn't have to put your finger in there if you were a little baby. You wouldn't have to put your finger in very far to touch those contacts and receive a fatal shock. So even in even with the shutter, the contacts in here will be deeply recessed, and that's how it's supposed to be. So it only bites the uh, the pin right at the end of its travel. So there's quite a bit of distance. So you'd have to put something in quite far, further than your finger's likely to go, to be able to even touch the contacts, even if there weren't shutters. With this, it's really near the surface. So that's another safety failure. The contacts should be much more recessed into the socket than they are. Another fairly major problem I have with this device looking at it, it looks like a toy don't you think? See with the brightly coloured pink squares it looks and feels like a child's toy and that means children are going to play with it. Let's supposing mum or dad or older brother or sister or whoever has bought this thing at their local market and they bought it because they want it to charge their phone or they want to power a device off it, who knows. They plug it in somewhere under the cupboard and they, they just sort of leave it out on the floor like that. Uh, so it's there for them to use it. Toddlers and babies that can move around, they're very, very inquisitive. And they're gonna be used to playing with toys. They're gonna have loads of their own toys and they're gonna find this thing lying on the floor and they're gonna play with it. And this baby or this toddler is going to see this thing and they they will have seen their uh, their olders, their elder spouses, their mum and dad or whatever. They're going to have seen people put things in it and take things out of it. The baby's going to copy that because that's what they do. So they're going to go and get a knitting needle or a fork or a piece of Meccano or a hand off a dolly or a piece of Lego, whatever it is. They're going to try putting things in and out of it, copying their elders. That's That's how babies and toddlers learn. That's the last thing you want a baby or toddler doing with a device like this. Because not only is there no shutter protection, there's no fuse protection either. So this baby's going to have a heck of a bad day when they put a knitting needle in this. I must admit, it looks like one of those children's toys that you get. That it's like a, it's like a box with lots of different size and shape holes in it. You know the kind I mean. So it's got like a circle hole and a square hole and a triangle hole and a star hole. And it's got a whole bunch of pieces and what you do is you put them in, you slot them in. Uh, so you've got to put the right peg in the right hole. I'm sure you've seen them. Most children have seen those. It looks like one of those to me. So you've got all different size, size holes. So the baby's going to crawl off and find things that fit in the holes. And that is a recipe for absolute disaster. I'm sure you'll agree. That's badly thought out. I've spotted another actually quite serious safety problem with this. Now, do you remember me saying that the earth pin on a UK plug connects to the case of the appliance, like the kettle or the toaster or whatever? So that pin connects directly to the case. Now, it would be very, very unfortunate and very stupid if you could put the earth pin in the live hole on the socket. And every, um, every socket standard in the world makes it impossible to do that because that would be very, very dangerous. And the same in the UK, you can't do it. So that's the uh, the earth. Now with this um, compliant extension lead, that there is the line. So that's the live one. There's no way you can go in. It doesn't fit because for one thing, the pin's too big. It's bigger than these ones. Um, even if it did fit, the other pins would foul, so it wouldn't wouldn't move. And it's got a shutter, so it's pretty much impossible to accidentally put the earth pin into the live um, the live uh, contacts there. Now of course even if it did fit you'd have to be quite stupid to put it in there but you know it could happen you know if the socket is under a cupboard and you're feeling around with your arm trying to get something in you could easily get it wrong and a child who doesn't know better might try different ways of putting them in. I can see it happening there's uh, no protection from that on here. See, that's the, the live. That'll go in. That is touching the contacts. It's in. So, supposing this was a metal toaster, and this was plugged into the wall. If I touch that toaster now, I'm probably going to die. Before I take this thing apart and have a look how it's constructed internally, 
I wanted to uh, plug it in, and I'm a bit nervous to do that, and just conduct a series of electrical safety tests on it uh, without having to open it. Um, so I've got my uh, power bar there all plugged in. So I'm going to try powering this thing up. See what happens. Already I can see that the pins don't even line up properly in the UK socket. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit tight there. So I've had to force that in because the pins don't even line up properly, which is really shoddy manufacturing. So I guess it's, uh, it's energized now. You touch the power switch if it comes on. There's no light or anything. Power switch feels a bit loose. Oh, there we go. No, I just hadn't switched on on the power bar. So there is a light. There's a little blue light there, which presumably indicates that the USB uh, things are on. And yeah, okay. So that has turned off the USB. I wondered actually if that switch just controlled the um, the mains voltage ones, but it actually seems to control everything. So that's fine. You won't be able to hear it on the camera, but that's making quite a horrible hissing noise already. It's uh, not a good sign, not a good uh, indicator of uh, quality electrical uh, construction. Let me show you something I've got here. This is a uh, electrical socket safety tester, and um, these are quite easy to obtain on eBay. They only cost about a fiver. They're quite a good little item. Uh, if you've got a multimeter, um, you can do all the kind of tests on an on electrical socket with that. Um, but if you haven't got a multimeter, these are a really good, convenient way of just seeing um, if there's any problems with the socket. It's a useful thing to have. It doesn't tell you on things like load and whatever. We'll, we'll come on to that. But um, it'd be an interesting experiment to plug it into this and see what it says. So just for the sake of scientific accuracy, let me plug it into the actual uh, socket set that I've got. Okay, it's registering 240 volts. Give or take. It's hovering a little bit, but there we go. That's about what you'd expect. The two leftmost uh, LEDs you can just see there are lit, which is correct. And if you look on the, um, the diagram, it says, uh, two left LEDs being lit is correct. <clears throat> so if this uh, extension lead cube thing here is um, constructed properly, you'll get exactly the same result, same voltage, same um, same two lights on. So uh, let's have a look, shall we? It's hard to even get it in. There we go. Okay, well, it's failed already. There's only one light on. It says open ground. That means that there's no ground, basically, is what it's, what it's telling you. So it's how I suspected. The ground, for whatever reason, um, hasn't gone through to the system, so that's a, that's a worrying fail straight away. Let's test the other sockets. Let's go around to this one. Uh, says the same thing, open ground. What's this one? Yeah, open ground. And finally, yeah. I'm not surprising you really, they all say the same thing. Open ground, so there's no uh, ground connection at all. I've just been outside to look for my continuity meter and I realise now I've left it at work. Um, but I just wanted to do a, a few further tests on this thing, just to check it is all actually wired correctly. So what I've got here is a simple 12 volt light, it's this little bulb in there, and a small battery, and two terminals. So you've just got a, a pin here, and a crocodile clip, the stuff I found around the, uh, around the shed. Now if you connect them together, you get a light which indicates continuity. So. Anything metal between them should uh, yeah, show results. It's just useful, useful little circuit to check that wiring is um, running the way you expect. 
So again, if I was to put that on a, on a wire, put the pin on the other end, it should light up, yeah. So it's a very useful, very simple circuit just to check that the wires are doing what you, uh, what you expect. So let's have a quick look at this device then. The sort of thing we'll be checking is if, say like the neutral and the neutral match and the live, and the live match. That's what I'd hope to see. Well, let's start by doing the, start with the neutral. Okay, so on here, that's the neutral uh, opening. So if I was to put this pin inside there, like that. Now when I touch the neutral pin here, which is this one, that should light up, right? And it doesn't, it's a big fat fail already. Let's try the neutral on this one. No. This one. No. This one. No. Okay, so the neutral doesn't seem to be connected. Ah, if I put it in the live, or the line, it is. Is that the same with all of them? proves the line and neutral are the wrong way around so at some point when they've made this thing they've actually got them reversed which is um, quite worrying yeah see that's the neutral it's definitely on the neutral on the plug but it's the the live or the line that's uh, energized there it's uh, rather worrying and that again is a, a massive fail um, now again with countries uh, using radial circuits that's not a problem, in fact you'll see on like a United States plug or a European plug they are reversible uh, and that's because the fuse has to be on the, the, uh, the live side, now because the fuses are on the fuse board in the building you can make sure that it is, so when you turn the, the plug around in say the United States you turn it around, the live and neutral reverse as well so it's always the live line that is fused, never the neutral. But you can't do that with a UK um, plug because the the, uh, the fuse is the other side of the plug. So supposing you could turn it around, and you can't, it's designed so you can't do that deliberately. Uh, but if you did reverse it, the fuse will be on the neutral side. And that doesn't help you so much actually, because if you develop a, uh, a serious fault within the device, and it takes a huge current and blows the fuse. Okay, the fuse is blown, you think the device is safe, but it's not because the line actually still runs into the appliance. Um, so you've still got the danger, that, that danger is still present and uh, there's live electrics in the device that you now think is safe because the fuse is blown. So the fuse has to go on the line side or the live side. Um, so the fact that they've missed them, uh, missed the right way around is actually quite a serious fault. Should we try the earth as well while we're at it? Just check that's connected. I know that it uh, didn't work because of the sheave, but let's just see if it's connected anyway. Now, oh, look at that. No. 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 It's quite worrying really, isn't it? So even if that did connect into the uh, the socket, somewhere between here and there, the earth wire doesn't connect. So that's another big fail. It's hard to find many ways in which this device doesn't fail from a safety perspective. Um, so I think the thing to do now is take it apart and have a look. Just looking at my tear this apart, it's got those uh, annoying tri-ring screws to uh, dissuade you from taking this thing apart. Uh, I do happen to have a box of security screw fittings. I uh, probably have one that will fit. No. 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 So, that 
one's a tri wing that might fit. Yeah. Okay, I got one. Let's open her up and have a look. Could actually do it without the ratchet. Yeah, incredibly cheap looking screw there. Yeah, you can turn it without the ratchet, it's really not that tight. Okay, well first of all, the most obvious problem here is there's only two wires. So it can't possibly have an earth connection. See I thought that maybe the earth um, had a break in it or somewhere so it'd be sloppy manufacturing. But actually there is no earth cable so it's been made deliberately dangerous. There is no earth connection in there whatsoever. Only got two wires. Oh, that's horrible. Look at that. And if you can see that there's a join in the cable there, and they've actually just soldered two pieces of wire together and just kind of slipped this bit of sleeve over it, which could shake loose very easily. So then you've got the neutral flapping around in there, so that's uh, that's good. Inside the sockets, there are actually terminals for the earth, but there's no wire there. They just left it off, just trying to save a bit of money. Again, there's, they've known full well that this um, system wasn't earth when they made it. Let's see if I can open this up a bit more. Ah, okay, so the plastic thing comes off. I think they'll all come off. That will help. There we go. It's not a lot holding these pink things on. Just one little clip really. Should all come out now. There we go. They're not fancy security screws inside, they are just ordinary Phillips. Okay, so we're just looking at the way this is constructed. The method of attaching the flex to the terminals is pretty poor. It's literally just a blob of solder. They've not even put it through the through the holes, they've just put it on and tacked on a bit of solder. Which is pretty rubbish really. So you've got your your input here goes through the switch, down here, connects up all the... So then you get to the end of the line and you've got these two very thin wires that connect to the USB circuit. We'll have a look at that in a second. Very disappointed about the, uh, the earth contacts there. It's criminal negligence for one thing. But, you know, to go on and on the box about how it's been individually inspected and it's super safe and all this, it's all just rubbish, it's lies. It's um, actually quite a dangerous device. Have a quick look at the USB side. It doesn't look too badly made. I'd say on the camera, you've got the um, two inputs there from the mains. That connects to there via a resistor. So you've got the mains level here and here. They are very close together there. 
I would say I would say probably a millimetre and a half clearance between those two. It's not ideal. They've got various sort of resistors and capacitors surface mount there. Pretty big silicon diode there, a little crystal diode and a couple of ICs. LED, that'll be that blue LED. A few capacitors there. Another silicon diode down there. It doesn't look too badly made. But no, that's what we got. I'm not too interested in that because it's only the it's only a USB thing anyway. Let's have a look at this switch. It says on the switch it's rated to 16 amps, that seems a lot. It does give quite a good connection. It's very small. But yeah, I reckon that would probably switch 16 amps. Okay. Let's um, separate one of these sockets and have a look at that. So these are socket modules and a little self-contained thing. They're pretty shoddy. They don't inspire confidence. I wonder if they come out. Yeah, there we go. Let's take the, uh, the contacts out. That feels very light, it's very thin. I can't imagine that that would give an awful lot of service. And this is the earth one they've not even bothered connecting anyway, but you know, they said on the box that the uh, the quality of these contacts was um, was very high. Well, that's definitely not the case. It's very, very thin. I don't know how thin that is. It's got to be, a, I'm going to say, quarter mil, something like that. Yeah. So, um, very flimsy indeed. Let's have a look at the cable itself that they've hooked all this up with. This is the incoming mains. Uh, we can just um, pull that apart here. It's got a strain relief on it. Very basic strain relief there. Seems to do the job. Yeah, the plastic of the case seems all right. It's, yeah. Doesn't seem, you know, too bad really, the case itself. And the cable is it's round in form, which is usually what you see on a three wire cable. Or a three core cable. This is too I think it's been cast that way deliberately. They're odd colours, red and blue. It should be uh, brown and blue. So yeah, that's another another failure. But you know, it's failed in so many other ways that are more catastrophic. That I'm not going to lose sleep over that. It does feel very thin for what it says is good for ten amps. Is a little bit weedy. Let's strip some of the core off and have a bit of a look. The good news is that does actually look like copper, so it should be. Let's make absolutely sure by scraping it, make sure it's not just copper plated. No, that is copper. Well, the weather's improved significantly today, so I've come outside, and um, what I'm going to do is put a load on that power cable just to check that it can take the 10 amps that it advertises that it's supposed to be able to do. I'm just going to show you my very uh, crude and basic test rig that I'm going to use for this experiment. 
got here an output on the side of my um, warehouse here this is a 32 amp um, IEC socket the plug in it this is fed directly to the consumer unit it's the the only thing on it so it's a radial goes right back to the consumer unit via a, a six mil cable and plugged in is a 32 amp socket uh, sorry plug and there's a six mil twin and earth wire over to very simply a, uh, a you know a double gang socket there and in it you can just see I've got a very basic but actually quite accurate power meter showing zero amps at the moment and got the cable not plugged in uh, obviously not yet now in the cable is a temperature sensor I've uh, done a little slit in the sleeve and put the uh, sensor inside so it's actually measuring the internal of the, the cable and there's the current temperature 24 well 25 ish and uh, that's just the ambient temperature this cable hasn't been plugged in yet um, so that's just the uh, the ambient temperature today is quite a warm day now for the load come over here the other end of the the cable I've got here a water heating element that's a two kilowatt water heating element so that will draw about eight amps or a little bit more probably uh, we'll see on the amp meter how many amps it draws I reckon it'd be about eight eight point three something like that uh, so that's under the rated load of the cable so I don't expect there to be any problems with that there's no water in it yet so I'm going to fill it with water just to cover the elements and also in the interests of uh, safety specifically mine I have earthed it uh, so that there's no earth in the, the actual cable obviously we already know that the earth just runs to a crocodile clip on the case of the metal bucket uh, just in case I splash the terminals and electrify the case something like that uh, so that's just for my own my own protection so I'm going to go and get a watering can now fill this thing up with water and then we'll get started the thermometer is settled on uh, about 21 it's cooled down a little bit that's fine that's what we're going to start on 21 so I'm not going to plug the thing in Let's see how many amps we get okay because it's not a very well fitting plug it does take a bit of force oh wow it's taking quite a bit of power actually And if you can see there, it's taking 10 amps just over. 10.2 to round it. Right. Start and stop clock now. Ten seconds in. I uh, can see some bubbling on the elements already. Don't know how clear that is on the camera, but it is bubbling. Temperature with the 10 amps, just over 10 amps. That's, I'm, I'm pleased it's that because then that is about the, uh, about the limit of the cable. And to be honest, I think it will do that. I think it will um, cope with the 10 amps okay. I don't think there's much margin for error, but I think it will do it. Temperature is increasing slowly. It's on 24 now. It's been uh, it's 55 seconds. So I'm going to leave this now for about five minutes and come back and have a look. We're just coming up to the five minute mark now. As you might be able to see. Just turning over five minutes. Uh, the water is continuing to, to fizz around the elements. Still 10 amps, a little bit less than it was, slightly. Uh, the temperature has gone up. It's now registering 26 points. Well, oh, it's gone off. About 26 and a half, thereabouts. It's actually very good. It's only gone up a couple of degrees uh, with the 10 amp load after five minutes. Uh, I will leave it to 10 minutes. But so far, so good. I 
coming up on 10 minutes now and power meter is still showing the same 10.1 amps the bucket's getting very hot and there's uh, bubbles fizzing off the element temperature has risen but not by much we're on 27.3 degrees so it's gone up a few degrees in fact to touch the cable and the plug it's it's warm but it's not really that warm so that's something the cable does actually take 10 amps like uh like it did say on the box they weren't lying about that that's about the only thing so far we've found that is within its specification again all in the name of science we're going to test to see how uh flame is hardened the case is now here's the case as you remember it's not got the electricals in it now on the box it claimed it was flame retardant and so it should be and what that basically means is that if uh, a flame is applied to it it shouldn't actively contribute to the flame and when you remove the source of the heat i.e this burner in this case it should extinguish within a couple of seconds it shouldn't just continue to burn uh, on its own accord like a, a fuel source would so that's what we're going to uh, have a go with now and see I light my little stove here there we go There's quite a good flame going there so some way of suspending this here we go we'll apply it to the flame and we'll see if it catches fire well, there's definitely flame there uh, right, it is actually on fire. It's supposed to self extinguish. It does not appear to be so. It actually looks like the um, the pink plastic is the thing that's burning on the white. Oh no. No, actually, it is all burning. That took very little heat indeed to to ignite. It's a very windy day. That is terrifyingly not flame retardant in the slightest. In fact, it's the exact opposite. With heat applied to the case for just a few seconds it has caught fire continues to burn as its own fuel source is billowing out copious amounts of black smoke which is almost certainly quite toxic and it's not going out so if there was an overload scenario inside the unit and it caught fire, this is what you're going to get. Stuck to the bar now. I got an idea. Well, 
Well, this charred out hulk is all that's left of the magic cube that we started out with. Of course, now I'm going to go and put it in the recycling uh, as I should do. But the irony is that what's going to happen to it then is it's going to go straight back to a, a port, loaded back onto a container ship. Uh, probably the same ship that uh, bought it here in the first place because they need ballast to return. Oh, it's going to go straight back to China, most probably. Assuming it doesn't get thrown in the sea on the way there. And uh, if it does arrive back in China, it's going to get melted down and uh, turned into more of these things, I suppose. Or very similar things. It's going to come back on a ship and we're going to buy them all over again. It's a bit of a sad state of affairs, really. But... I suppose that's the price you pay for, uh, as we are in the UK, quite addicted to cheap imported garbage like this. And I'm just as bad as the next person, but um, but anything we can do to stop it collectively is to stop buying this stuff. You can't depend on the authorities in the country of manufacturer to not allow it to be made or exported because that obviously doesn't work. You can't depend on the uh, border patrol in in here in the UK to stop them coming in because obviously that doesn't work either. You can't depend on retailers to not sell them because they do. So the only card left to play is just to not buy them in the first place and um, I guess that comes with uh, making people aware of the dangers. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you found it interesting. And uh, I'll do some more soon. Don't forget to subscribe and thanks for watching.